for so many fans, your iteration of Batman is the definitive one. I'm yes, sure, I, I'm sure when they come up, brainwashing <laughs> worked. <laughs> yeah, and, I'm sure, and I'm sure when they come to you, they tell you that, and they also maybe talk to you about the other versions of the character they've seen and what they think about that. I'm curious. I think fans would probably really like to know how you feel about particularly the the various live action uh, people who've shared the role with you. I'm always asked who my favorite live action Batman is, and I'm not going there. I'm not going to compare. I think I, I do think I was surprised when. Um, Warner Brothers didn't give the franchise to one actor, the live action, I, you know, because that's traditionally what happens. And then when I saw how differently the different actors did it, uh, I thought, wow, this is kind of brilliant because each actor brings a different quality to it. Um, and it's so interesting to see how each actor puts on the cape and, you know, what, what it brings out of them. Um, so I think it, it ended up being a really good idea. Um, but uh, everyone brings different qualities to it. Some are stronger as Batman, some are stronger as Bruce Wayne. Um, you know, it's, it's such a multi-dimensional character that there's many, many ways of doing it. It's like Joker. Uh, Mark Hamill's my Joker. He's the definitive Joker. He's a genius. I love working with him. And, um, uh, but then, you know, you see other actors do it, and you realize... There are so many ways of doing Joker. They're not better than Mark. They're just different. How much do you get the chance to listen back to any of your uh, work? Kind of? or do, are you one of these I am really bad at watching myself yeah. on film or listening to myself. I'm really bad. I think most people are that way. I really, I really have a hard time listening to myself. <laughs> what's, the, what's it like recording for... Like, the animated show compared to like the video games? Well, that's an interesting question. It's night and day. It really is. Doing the shows, the, the, either the TV shows or the direct-to-video movies, um, Warner Brothers has a, has a policy of always having the actors together in a studio, which is, which is actually kind of unique uh, because a lot of voiceover studios, they like to get completely clean takes. It makes their post-production editing much easier if each voice is recorded separately. But you don't get the same kind of performances you would get if you have all the actors together. Because actors feed each other, and, and it affects your performance. It affects the way you're going to relate to the other characters. Um, Mark and I, Mark Hamill, who does the Joker, we're, we feed off each other so much. We work together so well together that I know I wouldn't be as good a Batman if it wasn't for him. Um, he makes me better. So... I love being in the booth with the other actors, and that's a unique thing with Warner Brothers, which is great. So when you do the shows, you have all those actors in the booth together, you get all the interaction, and Andrea says sometimes it's like watching 12-year-olds, you know, it's just, you guys, I can't control you guys, you just guys are going crazy out there. So um, it's, very, it's very fulfilling. But doing the games, because of the technicality of how they're built, those have to be separate takes for everything. So you have to be isolated for a game. So like um, Arkham Knight, to give you an example, was the third part of the Arkham trilogy. There are 157,000 lines of dialogue in Arkham Knight. Because depending on how the game is played, all of those different variations have to be played. So I was in a booth alone at four-hour blocks of time, and you're trying to keep the, the Batman character alive. You're trying to keep the situation alive in your head. And you're doing line after line after line after line after line after line after line. And they say, OK, now can you do it with a little irony? Line after line. Keep the irony. Now can we have a little smile? You know, I mean, by the end of the day, you, you, you forget how to speak English. You know, it's, it's your mouth is just not forming words anymore. And you're still trying to keep the Batman character alive. You know what I mean? To, to keep it, you know, stay in that voice and stay in his world, alone in the vacuum. So it's, it's very hard. And it, it's four-hour blocks. You get an hour for lunch, and then it's another four hours. And you do that for a week. And then you usually get a couple of weeks off while they're writing more stuff, and then they bring you in again. And Arkham Knight took two years of that to build, of going into those sessions, you know, a couple of times, you know, a couple of weeks a month. Um, so it's, 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 it's almost like drilling teeth. 
you know, it's just no fun <laughs> building games. But then when you see the result and you think, oh my God, look how beautiful this is and how exciting this is and I'm a part of this. You know, I contributed to this. Um, and I'm so proud of the performance, especially given to how hard it is I know to do that performance when you're performing in a vacuum. Um, so it's not a, it's not a joyous process. And, and recording the shows is a joyous process. It's fun. It's why you become an actor. Building games is not why you become an actor. But the result is so beautiful. So it's a very interesting question. It's a very loaded question. Yeah. Hi, uh, so what's been your favorite Batman game to uh, voice over, even though I know how hard it is? Well, actually, I think, actually, and, and a lot of people disagree with me, but, you know, everyone looks at things from their own perspective. So I look at it from an actor's perspective and my performance. And Arkham Knight, the way it resolved, um, I'm not going to give anything away by saying how it resolved, um, was a real acting challenge for me. And I was really proud of how Mark and I worked with each other and how sick that ending was. I mean, it's a beautiful game. But, but Arkham Asylum is a lot of people's favorite because it was the first one and it introduced everyone to that world. And you, you saw this amazing rogues gallery of, yeah. of, of criminals all in this asylum and Batman's trapped in there with them. It was a great idea for a game. How does it get out, you know? But for an actor, from, from my perspective, um, Arkham Knight is my yeah, favorite. favorite. I was really proud of that performance. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. More than likely, you've been asked about this many of times, but how did the opportunity of Batman came to you? Well, that came out of the blue, and it doesn't happen the way it happened to me. It just doesn't happen that way. It was the first animated role I auditioned for. I had never done any animation. I was a theater actor who happened to be in L.A. Uh, doing a pilot for a series. And my agent just sent me over to Warner Brothers. I didn't even know War Batman had never been an animated show. I just assumed it had been. And so Bruce Tim and Andrea Romano, they had to kind of bring me up to speed when I was in the recording studio, you know, describe the character, describe the background. So the whole process for me was very improvisational on the spot. I was just dancing as fast as I could, you know, in the recording studio. And <coughs> to be honest, I think my naivety played to my advantage because I had no anticipation. I had no uh, pressure on me to perform. I just used my imagination. And because, oddly, it was a strange kind of kismet moment where life kind of leads you in directions, I had been, I had had a very traditional um, old-fashioned theatrical education. I went to Juilliard. I studied the classics. I was trained to do Shakespeare. You know what I mean? I was working for Joe Papp at the Public Theater. Batman is a very classic character. He's a classic, tragic hero. And I approached him that way, and it, it was perfect. There's something very epic about him. The very He's Shakespearean. He's a Shakespearean hero. And, and also Greek, you know, he fits in that whole genre of classic theater. And, uh, and then all of these insane characters, these villains, bounce off of him. But his purity remains, you know, his mission remains. Um, there's something very classic about that. How much control did you have over the character of Batman? I mean, how much of it is you and how much of it is script? Um, actors have zero power in Hollywood. <laughs> I'd like to think we have a lot of input. We have no input. The, you know the most powerful people are? The writers, the creators. Good scripts are gold. Um, and Bruce Tim is a great writer. Um, kind of a genius in this whole genre. He knows exactly what he wants. Um, they would very, you know, once in a blue moon, they'd say, God, we can't figure out what, you know, what would he say? What would he say? We can't quite come up with it. But that was like, you know, once in a blue moon. And how do you change? Obviously, you played Batman for a number of years. I mean, the character's constantly evolving. And are you making a conscious decision to evolve the character, you know, each time? Well, it's interesting. Rather than evolve the character, the trick for me over 27 years has been to keep it fresh 
and to be consistent because and I think being a theater actor originally there there's talents you develop about being able to do something eight times a week for a year uh, to keep something alive because each time the audience sees it it's their first time experiencing the story experiencing the character even though it's your eighth time that week you know what I mean um, but it's such an iconic character and people grew up on him um, so they have very early memories and impressions of who he is and if you're not true to that they'll nail you and you'll lose them so for me the trick has really been to be true to that initial uh, impulse that I had uh, when I was creating the voice and creating the character. And to me, it all goes back to the tragedy of his childhood, that dark moment um, when he had his world ripped apart. And rather than becoming crushed by misfortune, he transformed himself to conquer misfortune and to try and heal the world. Uh, that's why people love him so much. He's such a redemptive character. Um, so that's, that was the impetus for the voice for me, that it's all based in that darkness. You know, that's where that comes from. Um, and then he puts on Bruce Wayne, and he becomes very, you know, sophisticated and suave. But all of that's ar armor. Bruce Wayne is the armor. Bruce Wayne is the performance. Batman is where, you know, that's where the damage was done. You know what I mean? That's good. Was that good? If you could choose either an existing comic storyline or just a type of story that hasn't already been adapted into an animated, animated project, if you could choose one, what would you have Batman go through next? Well, uh, I would love to see them do uh, A Death in the Family or Hush. Those are both beautiful stories. Um, I think they'd be great to be done. But there are no rumors about that. I know I want to start a rumor here. There is no word about that being done. Uh, Non-Batman question here, because I'm a massive fan of the Venture Brothers, and <laughs> I'm a huge, huge fan. So could you tell us about uh, the character Captain Sunshine and working with the, those producers, and are you coming back in the new series? I, I wish. I said, doesn't he need a spinoff? People love Captain Sunshine. Um, it was funny. Uh, I, I, I love doing that character. It was funny. It's like everything you know, naughty about that, and you want to you do, a, do a spoof on Batman, you know. Um, I had a lot of fun doing it. And um, uh, no, there's no word of anything more being done with the character that I know of. But I had a blast doing it. I remember when you uh, did uh, Killing Joke, and you said at the time that you were really conflicted about doing that role, because it was such a dark performance of Batman, and you actually weren't Happy, you, you were okay with doing the, the part, but you weren't yeah, happy with kind of like the way that the tone had taken. Have you re changed your thoughts on how that performance? Well, I, I, it wasn't that I wasn't happy with it. It's just that I was aware of how controversial it was. Yeah. I, I appreciated that a lot of people were um, disturbed. Um, I wasn't. But I, I just appreciated the fact that, that people were. Um, uh, Batman has a very broad audience. It was, it was originally, the first Batman animated series was on prime time on Fox. It was never designed to be a kid's show. But they knew that they were going to have a kid's audience too. So they had to, they had to keep it a very adult show, which it obviously is, with very adult storylines and sophisticated artwork and sophisticated music and storylines. But they could never show a child in danger. You know, they had to go by certain standards and practices in the States that you, you have to respect if you know you're going to have audiences of under 12. You just have to do it. So the killing joke, the, the issue I had was that it was a great mature story for Batman Joker, but I know that a lot of the audience is still under 12. And that's, that's so rough. That's a rough though. story yeah. for, the, for people that young. And I had a lot of friends who said, well, I love that movie you did, but I'm not going to let my kids see it for 10 years. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I have it in a box, and he'll see it when he's older. Uh, but no, I, I, 
I didn't have problems with the story. I just, I, I understood people who did. I think apparently <coughs> we need to let you <coughs> traumatize more people on the show floor, but thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Was there another? Oh, the, you, that was for me? Get out of here? Oh, sorry. Okay. And it's great. The fans are wonderful. The Batman fans are, in general, pretty wonderful. You know, they're very passionate, and um, they care about the actors. They really do. They're, they're very considerate. So I love meeting them at the Comic-Cons. You know, when you do voice work, you never interact with the audience, you know, you send the performance out into the ether and you don't know how it's received. And um, so the only time I get to interact is at these things. That's why I like it.